This episode is made possible by our generous patrons. Welcome to the Ink to Film podcast, where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm James. And I'm Luke. And this week, we discuss Stanley Kubrick's 1964 film, Dr. Strange Love War How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. So around here, we've been having a bit of an embarrassment of riches recently. Okay. We've been watching some fantastic films, um, this one being no exception to that. I've just, what a fun watch this was and a rewatch at that. Yeah. I don't want to hear anything about your preversions this week. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> you prevert? What are you, a prevert? <laughs> um, I, yeah, I'd only seen this movie once before, uh, and, and I think I, I don't think I watched it closely. Like, I think I maybe was at a party or something because there were whole po- sections where I was like, I don't remember any of this. So this was my first, like, true watch of it, I think, or at the very least, the one that I remember best. <laughs> this is such a dense satire as well. It's like, yeah. it's so funny in such a, like, deep and and legitimate way. Like, it's not like surface level laughs. And there, there may be moments where you feel like there are. But it's like haunting, but also like like frighteningly funny moments, yeah. like moments where you're just like, this is so outlandish and crazy. And and like the message that's trying to be like put across here is is super scary, but you can't help but laugh at this stuff. Yeah. And, and it, it works on multiple levels, you know, like uh, I think there's like the surface level like, oh, that's just silly. And then like you can start to unpack it and realize that it's actually making an even larger point about something. And and the, the way that works is all really cool. Um, another thing that, that I liked, because we just covered Red Alert, the book that it was adapted from, and uh, I was surprised by how closely the plot follows the novel. Because, it, you know, I, I would think if you ask somebody, you know, if, if they knew that Dr. Strangelove was adapted from a novel, they'd say, yeah, but it, it probably was extremely different. And it is in tone, right? But the plot is actually really, really similar. Yeah, I mean, there's really just like two, I would say, major differences. One being Dr. Strangelove being in the film, and then the other is just kind of the ending. Yeah, the ending, yeah. But like the whole the whole idea of this like base commander taking it upon himself to to launch to start World War Three that that's that's all from the novel. So you know, shout out to uh, Peter George and and uh, coming up with this, you know. Uh, that, that then Kubrick is able to turn into this masterpiece. And that's one of the more interesting things is that he, reading this book, he was realizing there was more ridiculousness and just way over the top moments that like led him to laughing rather than being scared. And yeah. maybe that's with the advantage of like, a, I think he had like a, a couple of years after the book came out to, to develop the script and everything. So the novel was 1958, I think. And you said the movie was 64. So right. yeah, he would have maybe had a few years. The release of the movie was pushed back. It was actually supposed to be in 63, but okay. we'll talk about that in a little bit. Interesting. Um, you know, you hear people talk about like biting satire mm-hmm. and like, I think this is the template and this is like the the holy grail of that. Yeah. It's looking at something and, and just, just making fun of it to like no end and, it, and, it, it, and still having it be like a coherent and like fun to watch and interesting to look at. That's another thing. It's visually yeah. funny as well. And it really skewers, like I would say American culture in general. Um, and, and, and there's like, like I said before, like there's so much going on beyond the surface level. Um, so it'll be fun to kind of tap into that. Um, I know we've covered Kubrick before, uh, with the shining and I felt like that was a movie where I knew a lot more, like just like from the zeitgeist and from hearing things and like people talk about this like legendary process of making this movie, the, the shining. And, um, I, I, I feel like that's the case with a lot of Kubrick stuff, but I realized that for this movie, I know like almost nothing. So I deliberately didn't look up anything either. So the only things that I know was the stuff that we found when I was looking up stuff about the novel, right. And, and yeah. sort of some of that, the lawsuit surrounding the, the other film that had a similar plot and that kind of stuff, but that's really all I know. So I'm, I'm excited to learn more about it. As we talked about in our shining coverage, 
Kubrick is a, a legendary director in, in, you know, even if it's just for his, his, everyone knows he does like a million takes. He's so meticulous about the details. He's one of those directors that like was really in control of everything on the screen. And he had like such a clear vision that nothing else would do. And we talked about that a little bit in our last project with Alfonso Cuaron with Children of Men. And, you know, just that type of filmmaker to to be an auteur, to be like that, that very specific everything coming on this everything on the screen was like purely put there by that person and it's their vision um that's the kind of filmmakers that it's just so fascinating to to watch and study and and try to learn from and i feel like you were talking about some of the production stuff that that so you knew about the columbia um, lawsuit that went on where if you didn't listen to our last episode basically kubrick and the production company went to another production company who they were developing a movie called failsafe that Cindy lumet was directing and they they basically said it was the same script, sued them, and made them push the, the movie back further. And right. and Doctor Strange Love came out first. And Peter George, the the author of the original novel, yeah, yeah, Peter George was involved with that as well. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg for for the production of this film because I, I was really surprised. It seems like every everything that he makes has some just like legendary tales associated with it. Cool. Um, for instance, it's not a spoiler because it was a cut scene, but this movie famously has one of the most famous cut scenes of all time uh it was supposed to end and it was shot where the entire war room breaks out in like a pie food fight and everything's full of pie and you can't distinguish one person from another and it was supposed to represent you know like the the bombs that were being dropped and and like the way that like the world was just in full chaos and everything kubrick realized that this was like it was more slapstick than satire and and like took it out um, but there was actually really interestingly to put the context of the, what what time period this movie was coming out in. Um, there was a line in there that basically like the president got got hit in the face with a with a, one of the pies, and somebody was like, "Oh no, my young president has been has been shot in the head with or something like that." This isn't the reason they cut the scene. The scene was already cut, but another reason why it may have been cut had it made it through that that part was um, JFK was shot in I think November of 1963. Oh, and wow. they had to change yeah. a couple of things in this film because the president is so prevalent and because because, you know, it's so it, it was such a tragedy and yeah. so close to so many people that like having anything to do with the president and be, having it be right. satirical could be kind of a touchy, touchy subject. So yeah, it wouldn't be as funny. JFK was assassinated and, and he was assassinated in, in Dallas. And so like notably, one of the details is, um, you know, when the pilot in the film is going through all the rations and calling it out to the rest of the troops and he's saying like one you know, whatever it was, the food that they had and the oh, pantyhose yeah, yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah, all the stuff. Original, original and kits. originally he was originally the line was someone could have a really good weekend in Dallas with all of that. But then uh, they changed, they dubbed changed over to it to say Vegas because of the tragedy that happened in Dallas. So I guess Dallas is supposed to be more fitting with the kind of cowboy nature of that guy. I think so. Yeah, because Vegas like makes that. sense. I, I didn't bat an eye at Vegas, obviously, you know, but yeah, I could yeah. see maybe uh, they wanted something Texas for him. So and that that also pushed the the idea of a presidential like nuclear arms race like led film. They pushed they ended up pushing it to 1964 because of that. I think in January is when it came out, I believe. So I don't know, wow. just really interesting time period to be making a satirical. I mean, really like cutting edge satirical stuff too, because this isn't a time where people are are like super into hearing anything against the government necessarily, yep. and and. He's just very. Uh, it was a. It was a bold statement to make. And like, for, for instance, like the. This is a really oddball, weird story that I read. But um, I think Arthur C. Clarke and Kubrick were meeting, and they were uh, out to lunch or something like that. And they were having a conversation that would eventually lead to 2001: A Space Odyssey. Mm-hmm. And they w- some they saw something in the sky, some sort of shooting shooting star, or but it changed direction. So. Arthur C. Clarke was like, we need to tell the UFO detection agency or whatever it was. We need to let everybody know. And Kubrick was like, no, the Air Force does not want to hear from me ever since uh, Strange Love came out. <laughs> wow. How about that? So clearly they, he, they didn't like him anymore after this movie. Yeah. And, and 2001 I, I Space Odyssey, uh, we should absolutely cover at some point here in the future. Yeah, definitely. That was the movie that followed this one. Yeah. Can you believe I've never seen that movie? Wow, yeah, that's that's <laughs> crazy. We gotta we gotta fix that. Yeah. So, just a couple other things I wanted to say about Kubrick in terms of like where he was at. He'd this was I think his seventh film 
So actually, he had directed more films up to this point than I thought last week. Okay. I, I assumed that it was, this was like his third or fourth, but it's actually like his seventh. Wow. Uh, his films up to this point include Fear and Desire, Killer's Kiss, The Killing. And so those first two I hadn't, I hadn't seen, but I have seen The Killing and then Paths of Glory, Spartacus, and Lolita, which You've are all... You've seen all of those? Yeah, and all of those are like classic films that anyone would tell you are fantastic in their own right. So right, Lolita is another adaptation, you know, kind of infamous one. <laughs> oh, definitely, yeah. Yeah. Sort of the the subject material in that one's kind of touchy. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Uh, so yeah, his run from 1957 with Paths of Glory to Spartacus in in 1960, Lolita 62, Doctor Strange Love 64, yeah. 2001: A Space Odyssey in 68, and then Clockwork Orange in 71, and then it just goes on and on and on. He does a lot of adaptations, right? So there, there's definitely a bunch in there that we could, we'll probably end up covering at some point. I imagine. I feel like most of his filmography is adaptation, so yeah. we, we're definitely going to see some more Kubrick. He, we were talking about the detail that he that he brings to the films and. Um, this is a satire and yet, and yeah. we know he's so meticulous about everything that he is going to be in his films and they do ton, tons of takes. This movie, Peter Sellers in this movie, who's fantastic, who plays three roles. Yeah. Uh, so, which is crazy. It's insane. It's I, crazy. I feel like you don't see that uh, anymore outside of like, like really goofy comedies. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. The, some, yeah. It's quite a feat to be able to pull it off. You have to be quite, like a really talented Right, so he he plays the president, the uh, uh, Mandrake, the kind of British officer, and Doctor Strangelove, right? Yeah, it's wild. So originally he was also supposed to play uh, Colonel, I think it's Colonel Kong, the the like uh, cowboy guy that was like the pilot of the oh in the plane of the yeah. plane as well. So so this is another interesting story. Kubrick wanted him to play all four roles, and he was having a tough time getting a, a like a country accent down, mm. and on set one of the days he he so he's trying to get it down and and it wasn't like really working perfectly and then he ended up getting injured on set like he hurt his ankle in the bomb bay uh on the plane and when he hurt his ankle that was kind of the last straw to say like all right we're gonna get somebody else and so they went and got this guy slim pickens who was known for like being in like western films and uh. they, they the guy's not acting like that is him in this film like his <laughs> accent everything like he's just like that he came to set wow uh, on the first day with a cowboy hat on with all the wardrobe on and people were like oh he came in his wardrobe and they're like no that's like how he dresses so they went and just <laughs> cast a guy who was like that that was that guy uh. and legend has it that kubrick and company never told slim pickens that it was supposed to be a comedy <laughs> uh, i wonder if that's true that's funny there's so many stories that we could talk about here, and I'm sure we'll get into a lot of them. But um, I wanted to ask you just really quickly, generally, like how you felt about it. I know we've both said it's funny. Yeah. Uh, how was your viewing experience? How did a black and yeah. white satire from the from 1964 hold up for yeah. you in 2019? It, now, now, was it black and white? I, I, this is my ignorance of, of where technology was at. Is it black and white due to the technology of the time, or was that a choice by Kubrick to make it black and white? I think a bit of both, honestly. I think that if he wanted to in like 1964, there would have been the ability to to have it in color. I'm not a hundred percent on like the exact date. I know it's sometime in 1960s. I mean, this is his last black and white film. Okay, but before that, they were all black and white. Yes. Okay. Interesting. So like up to this point, all black and white. And then, and then this was his last one. I think honestly, it was like an aesthetic thing. Like movies had always been black and white for the most part, unless they were like technicolor or like, you know, colored in some way, unless the film was colored. So yeah, I think that it was probably a choice to continue being black and white. And then with 2001, he wanted to change the, change that and go color. And I mean, can you imagine a black and white 2001 A Space Odyssey? It would be a much different movie, I think. Well, I mean, I haven't seen the movie, but just from the little bit I've seen of it, it, it seems like it's it, it, it seems like maybe he embraced that. Like, this is the new way we're making films now, whereas this yeah. was kind of that more throwback style. Um, I think as a modern viewer, it's going to be I don't know, at least for me, it's always kind of a challenge to watch a black and white film because um, it just feels so dated. Um, but this movie like really plays well from a modern perspective, in my opinion, even though we're not in the midst of the Cold War. Uh, we still have uh, extreme levels of just idiocy and like over macho bullshit going on in our government to where it is almost satire, right? And, and mm. you know, it's been said so many times that like the shit that's going on now sounds like it it's something out of a 
out of a uh, out of a novel it doesn't seem like it could be possibly be real because it seems like complete satire and that in that sense that it's like uh i don't know it's interesting to watch a movie that was like yeah that, i mean some of this shit has been going on a long time and people have been noticing how ridiculous it is and yeah. I don't know, like, uh, I think we, we were talking before we started about the names of these characters and just going over them um, sort of started to to solidify this idea for me where it really is, I think, a lot about, like, that macho bullshit, right? Like, we, list some character names. So we've got Major King Kong. We've yeah. got Colonel Bat Guano. Um, uh, Brigadier General Jack D. Ripper, which I find particularly yeah. funny. Yeah, uh, Jack Ripper, yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, President Merkin Muffley, just yeah, right. Th- hilarious names, really funny stuff. Right, and and then you you we got Tur- Turgeson or something is the other guy who's like yeah. Buck Turgeson. It's just they're almost over the top like caricature names, right? They're also silly. Um, these characters all behave like that too. Like they're almost cartoon characters at times. Like they're o- they're over the top, but the stuff they're dealing with is also frightening and real too. Like real threats and uh just the cavalier nature of it all um the the i really think this movie is trying to say something about masculinity in a way that i don't know that at the time maybe people were picking up on as much but looking at Mm. it now i I see it everywhere in this movie i absolutely agree with you you there's there's like i mean from the first scene in the film there's like this like phallic like sex scene that goes on oh, between yeah, with two planes. planes in the air and then that was like played to like romantic music or uh, i guess you know more lighthearted music at least and and kubrick i was reading an article where kubrick was surprised that a lot of people weren't picking up on on a lot of the innuendo that he was building into this i, I think he's saying something about like you're saying like yeah maybe male masculinity or male sexuality or yeah. or just sex in general and like that how ta- the taboo nature of it during that time period um there's a lot being said for sure and and he was surprised that not a lot of people caught on quickly and i think somebody from like columbia university wrote wrote an article to him or wrote a letter to him and and still like said hey i caught on to all this innuendo and he he wrote a thank you letter back saying like you you figure like i'm glad you found that because that's awesome a lot of people have been yeah yeah and and i think that's uh that's that's a sign of a really brilliant piece of art right where it, like all these people can love it and then and then you know all of a sudden someone goes actually if you think of it this way and you like they have all this evidence and you can go oh my god i never i didn't see that and um if it lends itself to that sort of analysis i think that that's that's the sign of something that you can watch multiple times and like find different things every time you see it i definitely felt like yeah. i was finding a finding a lot more this time than the first time when i watched it where oh, where definitely. like i said it was a lot more surface level i think well, and like when I saw this movie, I was too young to really get a lot of what was going on. But I found it funny on a surface level. And that's just that it's just that the surface yeah. level of, of comedy is right there. And you can have fun with that. And then you can dig deeper. And like when you really start to think about the whole ridiculous nature of it, you start to think about you start to reflect it to our own modern day. And, and it's it's crazy to think like some of these things are ridiculous and funny and, and good to laugh at, but we're also laughing because it's scary and it's, it's yeah. close, to, kind of close to home. Uh, I used to, you were talking about how the portrayals were almost cartoonish in some ways. I agree with you, but I, I, there's some, there's like this fine line between, I think like the characters understanding, or at least the actors really understanding and, and putting forth the idea that this is supposed to be a comedy. Whereas I think a, a lot of this movie is played at serious. A lot of this movie sure. is serious until there are jokes. I think what I'm trying to say is that like characters don't realize that they're funny. Mm. Like like the president, yeah. for instance, like he's funny because he's because he doesn't know he's funny. Yeah. It's so it's funny out of like a ridiculous nature or like a like an unexpected way that he's, you know, talking to the Russian like president or whatever he oh, is. Man, at that time yeah. Dimitri. Guy. Yeah. Yeah. It's so funny because it's yeah. so absolutely ridiculous. You're not as sorry as I'm sorry, Dimitri. Imagine what I'm feeling. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, that kind of stuff just like gets me down to my core. It makes me laugh so hard. Uh, oh, and that's so an, that's the thing is like I was busting out laughing in this movie. It was that funny. Yeah. It really and is. And it is. And it still plays that funny. So if uh, if, if you haven't seen the movie, um, I, it gets a full recommendation for me. This is absolutely worth seeing. Um once you kind of acclimate to the black and white nature of it, I think you'll fully enjoy this movie. Um, even from a modern perspective, it's, it's really funny and it's just such a piece of cinema history that I think if you have any appreciation for that and you, and you are curious about that kind of stuff, I think this is an important movie to watch. 
and and iconic too i think it's extremely yeah. iconic in terms of imagery as well like something that i was talking about earlier was like it's funny visually because some of that is also played seriously like the war room has been has been used that kind of idea of a war room has been used for decades now yeah. and it and it like it looks like a war room that you would see in like some sort of in some very serious film and it works so well because of the ridiculous things going on in there yeah. in that really serious ominous room it works it's it's amazing and the lighting the way that the circular lighting is set up with everybody sitting at this massive table with the boards in the background it's it's pure it's purely iconic i just want to quote all the lines even though that's probably not very interesting but obviously <laughs> there's no fighting in the war room Gentlemen, yeah. gentlemen, I can't believe such behavior in the war room. <laughs> like, it's of all the places. Best line. <laughs> so that's good. That's got to be the most memorable line for me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the or the uh, or the what, what does he say about the fluids? Oh, the, our our precious the, the purity of our precious bodily fluids. Or I, yeah. he talks about it several times. Um, yeah, that always gets all me wild. Yeah, because that's played for such a, like you wait. You're waiting a long time to figure out his motivation, and yeah. then it's so funny. Oh, and it's so it's good like, when it's in the initial memo or whatever. It's like at the very end of his of his like statement, it says something about preserve our bodily fluids, and then or and then they're like. We're still trying to uh, get get some input on what the meaning of this last line could mean, you know, like because yeah. it just seems like complete nonsense, and and it is, of course. Um, but yeah, it sounds like we're we're ready to really dial into this. Um, but before we do, we have a little bit of housekeeping I want to take care of. Okay, sounds good. All right, so first off, I want to say a huge congrats to former guest Fonda Lee on her book launch for Jade War, which is happening today. I'm leaving after we record this episode to go to it uh, here in Portland, and uh, I'm really excited about it. That was a novel that we both read uh, during our coverage of The Godfather, where she joined us for three straight episodes. Um, Great episodes, great book. Uh, we highly recommend uh, Jade City, and then you know go pick up Jade War as well, because uh, I'm, I'm hearing great things about the sequel. If it's any indication, I'm going to be buying a copy. So there you yeah. go. That's my recommendation for it. Check it out for sure. Um, Jade City was it was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. It's it's so good. And uh, yeah, check it out. I don't know what else to say. Um, but beyond that, we got our hundredth episode coming up. And uh, so this is one of our last times. We got one more episode, the 99th, before we get to episode 100. And we wanted to uh, talk about our special offer we have going right now. If you're if you sign up to become a patron and you are a patron on August 11th, um, you're going to get a free token, which I was talking to somebody last night and come to find out. He goes, oh, so you, you use cryptocurrency. And I was like, no, what are you talking about? And then like, I thought about it and like by definition we are giving out cryptocurrency. <laughs> um, yeah, technically. Yeah, it's for our own jukebox, um, which you can use to commission projects of your of your choosing and and force our hand and force us to do them, um, which we'll happily do. And and yeah, we're gonna give it out to all levels. So if you just the you know our lowest tier is a two dollar tier. You get access to all of our bonus episodes, and you're gonna get this token, which you can throw in our jukebox and and put towards a project of your choice. Uh, so we, if you've ever thought about signing up to support this podcast financially, uh, we highly encourage you to do it now because this will be the the best time for like bang for your buck kind of deal. To bring it up, we talked about it last week, but this project was was commissioned by a listener, Steve E. So so thank you again to him. Absolutely. You know, it, it's a huge deal that you're able to commission this podcast and and get us to do it. And thank yeah. you for doing it because it was so so much fun to revisit. Yeah, that's the kind of thing you can do, right? You know, this is something we talked about. We we probably were going to cover one day, but it wasn't high on the list. But I'm really glad that we're covering it now. And you, and yeah, you have a uh, a patron of this podcast to thank for it. Um, so yeah, commission your own your own thing, absolutely. Um, we also are going to be on our 100th episode, featuring some short clips from listeners uh, in the episode where we're going to react to them. And we're basically asking you to send in a short recording. You can use uh, an app on your phone, the voice memo app, record it, send it to our, our Gmail, which is ink to film at gmail.com. And we're asking you to essentially respond to one of three questions. And those three questions are what's your favorite adaptation and why, or what's an upcoming adaptation you're excited about and why, or What's a book that you love that doesn't have an adaptation that you think deserves one or, or, or would lend itself to one? So just choose one of those, uh, you know, record yourself uh, answering those prompts. Um, try and keep it under 60 seconds and we'll include it in the, uh, in the episode. Make sure to say your first name and where you're from too. Yeah, that's going to be so much fun. I can't wait to, to hear all those basically live on the episode and react. 
yeah, it's our way to get our listeners involved. Um, we want to fully, like, we, we're inviting our listeners to get more involved in this podcast going forward um, because we welcome that sort of thing and we think it's really cool and it helps us stay excited for these projects. So going forward after episode 100, that's going to be a big thing for us, I think, and this is a way to to start doing that. Okay, I think that's it. That's enough of my my uh, housekeeping. The house has been kept. The house is kept. Let's get back to Dr. Strangelove. Before we jump into full plot, I do want to talk about Terry Southern. Um, he's an American novelist uh, known specifically for his satirical style. Kubrick and Terry Southern together wrote the screenplay for Dr. Strangelove. So a lot of the, the satirical elements can also be tied to this novelist, Terry Southern. I, I'm not as familiar. I didn't know if you were. Um, he briefly wrote for SNL, which I found particularly oh. interesting. He, um, yeah. No, I don't, I'm not familiar. So, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we shouted him out because according to Kubrick and, and a lot of the people involved, he was he was instrumental in, in executing this film in the way that it was. And many people said they read the screenplay before it was being filmed and thought it was one of the funniest screenplays they'd ever read in their lives. So wow. props to both of them. All right. So I'm going to read. I think this is a record here. I'm going to read the shortest synopsis for a film that, for anything we've covered <laughs> on the podcast so that we can really talk about all the details okay. more than more than the plot. Um, here is the very quick plot summary. Entire thing, or are we going to do parts? This is going to be the entire thing. Okay. I'll walk us through kind of some of the parts going forward, but uh, I was thinking we talk about it in four parts based on the different locations that, that it takes place. Okay, so, sounds good. This is the plot summary. An insane general triggers a path to nuclear holocaust that a war room full of politicians and generals frantically tries to stop. Extremely simplified version. Um but basically <laughs> yeah we're in full spoilers by the way um they f they don't stop it <laughs> um, they do not so, stop it yeah um it's uh yeah that and that's a big departure from the book where they do essentially right. kind of yeah they do stop it but yeah that was you asked me in the book episode you're like did you expect them to stop it and i was like no i don't i didn't expect them to stop it because i yeah. didn't know the changes obviously i didn't remember that this that this movie ended with like world destruction I don't know why. I, I somehow didn't realize that. I didn't remember that that's how it ended. Yeah. And one of the funniest monologues of all time about going into the, <laughs> going into the caves to serve the human race survive. Yeah. And we'll, we got to get to that in a second. Yeah, we got to. So what's the locations we're going to, what's the locations you want to talk about? I think it's an interesting way to talk about it. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. On the plane. We're going to talk on the plane okay. in the war room um, with the general and i had a fourth one that's the three i think i think there's only three <laughs> well i guess we can talk about we can talk about with the general when merc when he's alive and then when merkin is continuing on and like asking him to shoot the shoot the soda machine and all that to, mandrake. to contact yeah mandrake is trying to contact yeah. i say we save the war war room for last because that's where the movie ends okay yeah all right so we're starting with and the, we can talk plane. about more chronologically we can we can break off from the from the plane but i just thought this would be interesting so okay yeah let's try um it. We, I think it's really funny to mention the way that it opens. I already talked about it a little bit, but like the the refueling of the jets. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Do you know that was that that seemed very real to me? Like that with those yeah. real planes seemed like so it. that was stock. I from what I understand, that was stock footage that they compiled ah. to, and it was like some sort of like military training or whatever it was. They had some stock. They had some stock footage of that that they that they put into the movie. Where we were able to get the rights to and everything. Because a lot of the plane stuff after that doesn't look that great, but that looked really yeah. good. <laughs> so to talk about that since you brought it up uh -huh. the the b-52 in the film uh was a very secretive plane at the time that they were making this so uh -huh. they weren't no one was allowed to know the inner workings how it looked anything like that and the set designer was able to the interior cockpit he was they were they were looking at Im one image that they found in like a british aviation magazine or something that was like through up to the front of the cockpit and from that they recreated the entire cockpit and this is the craziest thing I've ever heard. The Air Force, they had like the PR people had some Air Force people come in order to like drum up interest and like kind of get some, you know, some input from the airport Air Force to hear like what they thought about, you know, this, this silly movie and everything. And the Air Force people that were there were so surprised at the accuracy of the cockpit that they felt that someone must have given insider classified information to the people, to the set designers and everyone in order to replicate it so perfectly. Wow. And Kubrick, Kubrick was worried because he heard about this and he had to contact the set designer and say, like, I really hope that every way that you would, that you made this was legal because I think we're going to be investigated by the Air Force. 
<laughs> well, and, and, and I mean, you had Peter George involved, which we talked about um, how he was a member of the RAF, uh, the Royal Air Force for, for Britain. And it seemed to me from his novels that he knew a lot about the B-52s, right? Like, I don't think he had direct, you know, knowledge, but he had such intimate knowledge of like those kinds of planes, it seems like, um, mm-hmm. that I, I can't, that I imagine that his input would probably help with anything like that too, right? Like somebody who's so no- knowledgeable about, about that kind of thing. Maybe, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if he was on set or not, or if he was involved in like the development like that, but he definitely did. He, he did have a credit on the screenplay. So he did help yeah. write in some way with Kubrick and, and uh, Terry Southern. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I think there was another plane that I was reading that they were basing a lot of the stuff off of. Yeah, so there was like an older something similar to a B fifty two that was that they were drawing a lot of the uh, information from, but ultimately like that one image is what they they look back hmm. and say like this is kind of how we reverse engineered it. Yeah. I just thought that was crazy because there's a that was a crazy story that I was just like, it's like that that kind of level of detail on a Kubrick set that's just like you're gonna the Air Force was like you you totally got classified information to make this happen. Wow. I uh, so I noticed a a young Darth Vader was on the plane. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's pretty cool. He didn't have a lot of lines, but I was like, "Hey, it's Darth." That was pretty. James good. Earl Jones, yeah, he. Yeah. Uh, this was his first role, I believe, like film role. Stanley Kubrick saw a performance of of I'm not sure which play, but a play, and and James Earl Jones was in it as well as George C. Harding, or sorry, George C. Scott, who played Buck Turgeson. Right. So like, what a great performance that one was too. That was crazy, and and there's also some craziness that went on with that. He was notoriously like kind of a bad boy and didn't get along with everybody and like wanted his own way very stubborn and and hard kubrick was like i still want him he's gonna fit the fit the role perfectly what what george c scott was worried about was that he was he was having to give such a big performance way over the top really really wild where he was used to doing more of like a tough guy like subtle role right and he felt like this was like he was getting bad direction from kubrick who was like, no, you just got to, he's like, basically he convinced him to do practice takes and where he went as big as possible and actually roll on those ones. Mm-hmm. And Scott uh, Scott didn't really know 100% that that's what was going on. And a lot of that <laughs> stuff was used. And after the movie, he was like, I'll never work with Kubrick again, ever, because he because he betrayed me. He felt betrayed. Wow. And But eventually, I guess years and years and years later, he came around on it and was like, all right, he, he got the better of me, but like he got a good performance and ultimately like what a great film and all this stuff. And he came around on it, which wow. I thought was really cool. It seems like every time I hear about Kubrick and the way he interacts with his actors, I mean, some of it we talked about in The Shining is like potentially unethical, but it just, I don't know, it just seems like he... he is a master at getting these performances out of them and some somehow by hook or crook. Right. Yeah. And this guy, like, this is not the kind of guy that you would see like a really over the top funny performance from usually right. like, and so he was able to get that from him. But something I found fascinating was because I said that he was quite a, uh, quite a stubborn person to work with. He, he was also a huge chess fan. Like he was really, really into chess. Okay. And I guess not a lot of people know, but like Stanley Kubrick is like a master of chess. Uh, player like he he has been like that was like his life for a while was playing chess and he's like absolutely incredible at it and he has a mind that he has a mind for it and uh scott felt himself to be a pretty good player and so kubrick brought a chess set on onto set multiple times and throughout a lot of the filming they would play each other and kubrick would smoke him constantly Wow. Like like Scott would be th- sitting at the sitting thinking about his next move because he had downtime in between setups and shots. But Kubrick didn't. He was running around doing stuff. And then he would eventually Kubrick would show up and then Scott would do his move. He had been contemplating for 15, 20 minutes and Kubrick would immediately just move his piece and then walk back away. And, and like he would just smoke him every time. Wow. Man, so this is definitely a, sort of an aside, but um, just we're talking about chess. I have to mention this. You know, you can fall down some weird rabbit holes on YouTube. Uh, oh, yeah. one, one of one night it led me to this video that I saw of there was two chess, like uh, chess masters. Right. And the premise was each one of them believed that their goal was to um, play a layman, like somebody who's not a professional chess player and like slow play them like like uh, pretend like they're not very good. And then um, slowly start to like turn it on. And then in the last few minutes, just like destroy them with their full like chess master powers. And the funny thing was both of them were under the same impression that that's what they were doing 
Um, and they didn't know that the other person was a master. And just the way that that like the game played out was actually really entertaining. <laughs> and as wow. you can start start to see like them both start to like go, hmm, like wait a minute, when the, when they would do a move that was like a normal person wouldn't see that kind of deal, and and then the speed starts picking up in a way that was like. I think indicative of it and it was it was just wild and uh you can find that if you search for the right keywords I'm sure on YouTube if you're interested in that's that sort so cool. of thing. <laughs> that's yeah. awesome, dude. That's and then so I had like cool. a million chess videos that I didn't want to watch after that showing up on my recommended videos, of course. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> let's get back to Doctor Strange Love. Um Oh, so, so we were you, talking yeah. we were talking about the 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 plane. So let's let's focus on that some more. Yeah. I did want to say something about James Earl Jones real quick. He uh like I said, this was his first role, but to hear that voice, that legendary yep. voice of Mufasa and Darth Vader, yeah, yeah it's it's so cool to, to like get a random uh, James Earl Jones and like to, like to have your first role be in a Kubrick film. I just I'm always in awe of the people who were able to like work with Kubrick when they were young. Like you know Tom Cruise worked with with Kubrick and like on Eyes Wide Shut. Oh okay, yeah. In like '99, so that's or like you know that was his last film. So that's so interesting to think of like a master filmmaker working with somebody, and then to see where a lot of these people would go on. Like James Earl Jones, like look at that career, look at like how iconic he's become as a as an actor, yeah. and like Tom Cruise in his own way. Sure. So my the point I was going to bring up about the crew and the uh, the the betrayal of these guys on this plane is how like that is one of the biggest differences uh, because in the book these guys were were tragic figures and 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 heroic and and the main captain was like near death you know f- trying to finish his mission and and that was translated into something more comical with the, like the plane like obviously was breaking apart and and the the bomb not releasing and 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 our guy going down to 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 try and repair it um and I don't know. It's just I can see why Peter George also was initially unhappy with this view of it, right? Because it seems like it's really making fun of these guys, which we know because he because of his history in, in, in the Royal Air Force. Like it seems like that's the people he really identifies with. So it felt like the heart of his book was being sort of changed, right? So that, right. that's always got to be tough. Yeah, I think I think really it was the it was one character on the plane though in my opinion like james earl jones character was like asking questions and being like i don't know if this is like i don't know if this is what we should be doing like are we sure or like the the thing broke right um something broke and he's trying to launch it and he's like it's not working it's not working it's not working they tried everything i think it was just like kong was the was the was the comedic element on the plane absolutely and i mean he goes he gets his cowboy hat at and he's like this is the real deal and he throws his cowboy hat on and you just know that what you're in for at that point (laughs) But even so, what's funny about that is that he was never told that it was a comedy. So he was playing it kind of as a straight action. He was, but it, it may be a but, but but I, I but, like. But think it. about, but think about like your way over the top action films and stuff. Like, like you can see it, it played in a different way, where it's right. like it's like he is just way over the top. Like maybe like, he thought it was just a little campy or something. Yeah, yeah. like yippee ki like 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 yeah. that's it, like you know what I mean. Like he's kind of in that same kind of vein. Well, there. so so we got to talk about the one of the most iconic moments in this movie and that's him writing the bomb um yeah that's you know like even before i saw this movie i knew that that scene was in it right because like that is just something you see everywhere it's like a i imagine it's something that had never been done before like that in 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 itself is such a satirical moment of like the cowboy doing like literally screaming yeehaw and like slapping his hat around and and, and writing Mm -hmm. a nuclear bomb into the ground like I don't know. It's so crazy, and, and and in and of itself is like lampooning American macho mentalities and and how self destructive they may be and and uh, destructive in general to the world. And um, but also it's like kind of fun, and you kind of laugh at it, and you kind of get it. I don't know. It's like there's a lot going on there, and I love the way it's set up in a way that's almost kind of believable too. Because I remember when I saw that, I was like, why would that ever happen? That's so ridiculous. But the way he's like sitting a atop- he's sitting astride it and he's trying to like fuck with this panel to get the doors to open and he like mm-hmm. I, it seems like kind of accidentally hits it and and maybe a button gets pressed or something and like he, the bomb just drops and so it's like a moment of like oh shit but then he just decides to go with it and write mm-hmm. it down I guess I don't know it's really interesting I read something about how Peter Sellers um, like one of his friends came to set and actually like helped them with that idea to have him riding the bomb on the way down um, and the way that they achieved that shot is they had a crane and they were craning up from the bomb, like past the bomb. 
while having like a green screen below kind of thing so that they could just add in like the effect of getting closer to the ground and i mean it's pulled off so it looks really good like it still does look really good it doesn't look as as bad as like oh yeah it's ridiculous but it doesn't it doesn't look quite as bad as like some of the the b-52s flying over the mountains and stuff Mm -hmm. like it looks more real with that with somebody riding and everything but yeah clearly a very very (laughs) hyper satirical moment because it is just like what is that saying about like the mentality of someone who who does have to to do these things who does who who like you have to believe in it as much as that yeah. guy believes in in like that bomb going down like, like the joy like, of that moment for him like this is the crowning achievement of his life that was the, yeah cuz he and, was that was what he was born to do because like this is this is his duty and and yeah it's really interesting to like yeah. to think about how serious it is while also being that's the most ridiculous scene in the movie yeah uh, any more stuff with the, the with the plane? I I feel like there's not a lot more. Yeah, I just have one more little thing to talk about, which was the the second unit crew went to shoot a lot of basically the green screen that we see behind the model plane throughout the movie as the plane is supposed to be traveling towards its target in Russia. Um, they're shooting in Greenland, and they flew over a secret military U.S. military base, and uh-huh. um, they were taking pictures, and they were eventually forced down by fighter planes. So the planes oh, forced shit. them down. They they landed, and on the side of the plane it said like Doctor Strange Love on it, and they were told to come out. And the craziest part was that like the crew who was on the plane, when they were being forced down, they were looking around for anywhere to land, and there was like nowhere to land. So it was like a hidden U.S. base where they had uh-huh. to like there was just snow everywhere. Um, they were forced down. They had to get off the plane and like get on their faces, basically on their hands and knees, and and like they were they were thought to be like Soviet spies. Wow. In That's the crazy. early 60s. So, like, I mean, just, like, legendary things happening. It's, like, such a funny, like, ironic moment that, that they're making this film about the Air Force and, yeah. and Russia and, like, the attack. And it's funny how life works like that. Well, in the opening uh, thing where it says the official position of the U.S. Air Force is that n- this could never happen and stuff like that seems... Uh, pretty serious in, in if you knowing all I know now about the Air Force and how they their relationship to this movie. Well, so this film actually changed some U.S. policy too. The way that they were unable to reach, like the way that the joke was being made, that they were unable to reach Washington in order to get the the information across. That was like they actually like thought like, oh yeah, it should so we should find a way that's easier to to make sure that people can get information to us. And also I think something was put in place to make sure like none of this could ever happen. Like things were literally implemented to be like, nobody can ever take full power and call an attack like this because well, of the film <laughs> and, and probably the, the move, the book as well. So potentially saved, uh, save some lives. Who knows? Um, yeah. yeah, let's, let's move to the, to the base and talk about what happens there. Okay. So shifting focus from the plane to the base where, uh, Brigadier General Jack D Ripper has called in the assault and um, it basically locked down the whole base and sent out all the uh, messages that he needs to send out to to kind of start World War Three. This guy's performance is really something else. Um, I, I I it wasn't until the moment where I think Mandrake comes in to talk to him, and we get this shot from like underneath, and he's got his cigar in his mouth and he's like a fucking chimney. Like there's so much smoke coming out every like every time he talks, it's blowing out. And then, um, or like, I don't know, he's like a fucking dragon or something. It's crazy. And, and, um, just like he gives this whole monologue with this cigar just burning. I don't know. It's just something so hyper masculine about it too. Right. Um, like we talked about before and yeah. it, it just, it just really works. Yeah. Sterling Hayden, uh, was brought out of retirement to be in this film by, by Kubrick as well. So he's like an old Uh-oh. school guy. That's awesome, man. He he brought out. Whenever to, you hear to, about somebody getting brought out of retirement, I just think of uh, Gladiator, like the yep. the guy with the with the crazy <laughs> mask and stuff. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I mean, he, his performance in this is like so like what you would think of when you think of like a hardened general in a in a military in some sort of war movie or something like that. Uh, yeah. This guy fits that really well, and so he, he is does. intimidating. And it makes his turn to like basically defending the, when he pulls the the uh, machine gun out of the out of the golf bag and he's like defending his office. It makes it so much funnier, and yeah. and not to mention his his uh, <laughs> the fluid conversation that happens. The uh, Man, the the discussion of fluoride, um, which by the way is still something that people have like crazy yeah. beliefs about. I, um, I wonder which if I'm it's sure also was, was the case back then. 
Oh, definitely. I, I know. So I have a I have a story here, but I feel like maybe the movie has like kept it going as long as it has, like because it's kind of been know. like. I mean, can you watch this still... movie and go like that guy's onto something? <laughs> I don't know. I don't I guess know. People can maybe. Yeah. Who knows? So uh, General Ripper's paranoia about water fluoridation being a communist plot is based on a conspiracy theory circulated by the extreme right wing John Birch Society in the 1950s and 60s. The organization, which was founded in 1958, was quite influential in conservative politics at the time, and the fluoridation is a communist plot theory took hold in many rural, rural areas in the U.S., with some small towns going as far as to not only ban fluoridation of water, but to pass ordinances requiring the arrest and jailing of anyone who advocated it. Wow. Well, we still don't have it in Portland, Oregon. I could tell you that much. It's probably uh, because it's... of General Ripper. Yeah, and everybody's teeth suffers for it, from what I understand. Really? Um, yeah. Uh, cool. Because I came here and, and, and the dentists look at my teeth and they're like, oh, your teeth are great. Um, and they're like, are you from around here? And I'm like, no, I'm from Florida. And they're like, oh, that's why. Because you guys actually have flu- fluoride in your water down there. And apparently it really helps with dental health. Wow. Um, so, yeah. So apparently he wasn't onto something. And make sure you drink fluoridated water. <laughs> I mean, you what. don't have to drink it, but it, it doesn't hurt you. <laughs> like, yeah. it's, it's just a chemical. It's in such a very small quantity. It helps keep the water clean you know, for one, and, and, uh, yeah, it doesn't hurt you. I don't know. I'm not a scientist, but, but I know that it's a bunch of bullshit. So that's, uh, that's as much as I know. (laughs) Now we'll probably get an email from an angry, you know, conspiracy person telling us why we're wrong, but well, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) so Mandrake is in there and he is like the voice of reason in the office trying to stop, uh, Ripper from all this stuff happening. How did yeah. the joke play for when he was like describing exactly like what his like why his reasoning was that that the uh, you know they're they're after us they're infiltrating us or whatever it was and then and then he basically gets to the point where he's like yeah I, I uh, they're ta- they're coming for our fluids like they're gonna they're yeah. gonna take our fluids because we only drink fluids. water here we drink water and Rain they don't water. drink yeah they don't drink water here they they or over there they drink uh, vodka, vodka and yeah no that story he tells he um. He even, and I think this is very pointed, um, he asks Mandrick, I asks him, when did you first discover this this thing with your fluids and all that stuff, right? And he right. talks about a time in which he basically uh, had like uh, erectile dysfunction. Is, no, is no, no. Between the lines. I think um, it's... Like he, he, he said he was, it was like during the act of love, right? Like no, he, I think... He I had think something for, where he couldn't perform or something. So, so what, I, for what I got from it, what I understood is that he ejaculated and then became fatigued. So like the fluid being oh see I thought it was I thought it was that he just couldn't perform and so he blamed it on he had been drinking this water or something like he had to have some reason I don't know I'd I'd have to go back and watch that scene again I guess yeah I'm pretty sure because he talks about how like women are after his fluid as well and like sometimes he'll let them have it or something like that or like he'll have sex with them but he won't let them have his fluid and like basically I think that he like it was ejaculating and then felt like fatigued later on and said like it's like you're losing your essence you're losing like a part of you and that's what they're coming to take is our essence so we're fatigued and weak yeah you know what's crazy is this is the kind of shit that like I could totally see reading on Twitter though (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) man people will make a conspiracy out of whatever they can yeah man it's insane and 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 no there there is like a hyper masculine culture that um you, you can you can stumble into if you're not careful and um there is a lot of this like magical thinking related to to sex and to your body and like all this shit where people like you know you got to do this for performance and all this stuff and i don't know it's wild man and a lot of it's complete bunk and 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 uh it's just I don't know if it's it's like it's funny and sad to see that it was still such a thing back then and it's still yeah. a thing now and it hasn't really gone anywhere. This this film really brought to light the idea that like you, you know it feels we are definitely in some rough times right now. There's a lot of shit going on that wasn't going on before, but it it also brings to like like a lot of these people are going around saying like make America great again. And it's mm-hmm. the, this idea that like it it was so great before, but like there was fucking stuff going. And I'm not talking about the this ejaculation stuff. I'm talking about like more of like the, what we get in the war room and that kind of thing. But yeah. just this idea that like it was always pretty shit. Like people were worried about the end of the world in the '60s, and like yeah. like you know it's still it's still up in the air. Like it's still we're still worried about the end not of the to, world. Not to mention the rampant unchecked sexism and racism. Yeah, of absolutely. The, the '60s yeah yeah but but yeah so it just makes me it th- this film really makes me think about the fact that like it's always bad like it's like it's always it's always like <laughs> yeah this makes <laughs> it's always bad that's a good takeaway <laughs> but it's also like it's also like it's makes always you feel, been bad it will always be bad 
<laughs> but it makes you feel a little bit better about like the idea that like oh it was good and now it's bad no it's just yeah. always been bad so just realize that like it's no worse than it ever was there's a certain power in laugh being able to laugh at something too though right like, mm-hmm. like it takes away some of the terribleness of it if we can just like have a dark laugh about it you know oh i yeah and i absolutely believe in that like this idea that like you you have to laugh about stuff no matter no matter the situation because if you don't the alternative is like screaming until you die like you know what i mean like complete despair there's nothing else it's just you have to you have to figure a way through it i think laughter is really interesting in that way that like you can feel it you can still laugh and you can still like laugh at things that are just the most dire and like dark things that can happen so do you want to talk about how like the, when the invasion starts and like I said they keep pulls the machine gun out and he's like firing out of his oh, office yeah. and Mandrake is trying to get the code all along. And, and the way that was shot I thought was was really convincing like um there's a lot of, we got a lot of like over the qu- shoulder like war shots of these guys shooting at each other. Yeah. That um almost felt like it was from a different movie. Definitely. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely feel that. Yeah. Even like even the way that the things were shot in it was all played for laughs, but like the way everything was exploding through the windows and the, the, the bullets flying in the in like the squibs going off in the walls and all that stuff, like that's very clearly shot as an action film. Like as you would see yeah. it shot in another action film. So. Oh man, Mandrake following him like when Mandrake's trying to win him over to get yes. the code, yeah, and he's recounting he's like just like we did before when I was, I had the belt. Do you remember I had the belt and I was giving you the belt and like just the, yeah. <laughs> trying to convince him that like what they had done was so awesome. It was so funny. They had gone and, through something together. Yeah. Yeah. Like remember me with the belt <laughs> so and you with the gun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and the way he shot it too was also like very phallic. I feel like he was holding it really low, like down by his crotch and, mm-hmm. and like the way he was holding it and stuff. Like, I don't know, man. The more I think about it, the more I, I see this kind of stuff all over this movie. Yeah. Like, if you if you watch this movie and you've never thought about that, like, I, I don't know. Like, I, I hope I'm opening some new doors to you and you're open to it, you know, but uh, I, I see it everywhere now the more I think about it. No, I mean, it's, def- it's definitely there. Especially, I mean, the idea that he opens the film with that, the one that I'm talking about is, like, I mean, you've been touching on it as well as, like, that macho. Like, this is, like... Yep phallic like this is this is like sex related or this is like macho well and and linking that to war yeah yeah like 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 the the drive for war and killing and 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 supremacy of america and how a lot of that is like these guys who feel this drive to be the biggest dick right and to and and there's so much of that going on especially in the in the war room we see later um yeah speaking of do you want to do you want to pop over to the war room for a little bit yeah we should let's go to the war room yeah, man, no fighting in there. Um, so, <laughs> gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, we we did see, this this Tur- Turgenson, Buck Turgenson guy is so over the top. When we first meet him, um, we actually meet him through kind of his secretary re- relating things to him in the bathroom, which I thought was actually a really clever scene. And then um, I love his mannerisms when he's on the phone. Mm-hmm. And to me, it was like he it was like he was wearing a uniform, yet he wasn't. He was like in his underwear. But the way he like slapped his stomach and then like was like s- like putting his hand on his hip and and talking like it just felt very much like he was pretending like he was wearing a uniform even though he wasn't. I don't know. Did, did yeah. you get that from that scene? Yeah. No. I mean, I think him being introduced in the bathroom is is also interesting because he like uh, it's like an intimate space, right? It's like somewhere yeah. where where it's the, the the what's the weirdest and funniest place that you could introduce somebody? Yeah. Probably. Like, well, and he's sleeping with a secretary. And, yeah. Right. So you know permiss like and then the way he like was talking about like say your prayers and then he talks about like he talks about praying several times and it seems so incongruous with like the behavior we're seeing from him mm-hmm. and i think that shows that like um the 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 two ways of thinking and how people are able to hold two ideas that are completely at odds with each other in their minds and not really see it mm-hmm. and we're seeing that going I, there's a word for that that i'm i'm drawing a blank on but we're seeing that in this guy cuz like on one hand he's like so gung ho for war he he's so cavalier about like the deaths that are going to happen and he gets excited um, about it too like he's like yeah. he like oh, no. you know, he's, he's like so my, my my guys are going to get in there and they're going to bomb 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 and like he like throws his arms out <laughs> and he does the plane stuff and he like realizes what he's doing um, yeah. and that's what i think i that's what i think um he was getting at when he felt like Kubrick was making him go like way over the top cuz he was like there were times when he was way way over the top and it yeah. still worked it didn't feel really so really wonky so yeah, I, I want to talk about Peter Sellers because I feel like we haven't talked about him enough. He he yeah. makes this movie for me. 
the fact that he's Merkin and and the president and Strangelove, and the way that the president is played, there's stories Wait, about no. Merkin and the president, are the same guy. He's Mandrake. Mandrake, yeah, sorry, the other there M. You go. <laughs> so Mandrake, Merkin, and and uh, Strangelove. Doctor Strangelove, um, yeah. All of them are absolutely hilarious in their own ways, and there's funny stories, like behind the scenes stories about how originally they were playing the president as also like very very funny. And yeah. everyone in the entire war room was just cracking up because he was mostly improvising a lot of those lines and people were just dying laughing in the backgrounds and stuff. They couldn't keep it together. And then mm. that mixed with the fact that like everyone, every like uh, Kubrick came up with the idea that like the president should be the, the straight man with everybody else th- being like like funny or weird or crazy or whatever. And he's supposed to be yeah. much more straight. Um, and so he was he was he was very much like this, like. He realized like the gravity of the situation. It feels like, yeah. and a lot of people, except for when he was on the phone with Dimitri, because that was yeah. just pure comedy to me. Uh, that's um, the the most amazing scene, and apparently, like that was a lot. Most of that was improvised as well. Like he's the first line was like, "Hey, Dimitri," like starting like that, and then just boom, improvised for like a couple of minutes. Wow. And like he's he's probably not talking to anybody on the other side of that phone either. <laughs> no, know? probably not. Yeah, nobody's more sorry than I am. <laughs> it was so so good. Um, our our boys did something silly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right <laughs> one of our boys he did something silly <laughs> oh they did something silly they're starting a, world war three and the destruction of the world <laughs> it's yeah. so wild and oh speaking of um the big board right like uh the, when he's gonna bring in the russian ambassador he's like he's gonna see the big board and oh, yeah. uh, he's so worried about it and then the way he um there's a moment where he trips when he's like gesturing and then mm-hmm. he like rolls and kind of recovers and finishes his lines. And to me, that just seemed like something that happens accidentally. But maybe it was fully planned. I don't. Do you know anything? Yeah, it was. That was that. That take was left in. And this is what I'm talking about with Kubrick being such a such a meticulous and such a specific director. Having this film be so so you know improvisational, uh-huh. um, and like having like the trip stay in because it kind of fit what the, what the mood was going on. Like that's like yeah, the guy was like out of control. So yeah, it totally yeah. works. And so he just like he's like really in keeping with the idea that like what works works and like it doesn't necessarily mean like a hundred takes doesn't mean that it has to be a perfect take it just has to be like a magical take so yeah well I think and, and knowing when to when to spot it because right. you could easily look at that and go oh we can't use that takey trip that's not what's right. supposed to happen but then like being able to recognize no 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 that's actually great and we're, we're going to use it exactly that's really cool so uh, I did want to talk about that famous cut scene really quickly as well because. Um, he ended up cutting it also because it was uh, everyone was laughing through it. So that became a thing was like Sellers was making everyone laugh throughout the whole movie. And uh-huh. when Dr. Strangelove is giving the monologue at the very end, you can see oh actors God. bright cracking in the background. Really? Yeah. Because I I, I, there was a couple that were definitely stoic and weren't because I kept looking because he, he's he, his performance is incredible. And I was looking to see like if people were going to crack up and I wasn't spotting it, but maybe I wasn't looking far enough back or so, something. I, I don't think it happens often because what they had to do was cut around the laughter. And the editor talked in this documentary I was watching. He was like, he was like, I cut just as people started to laugh like so many times. And I was having to cut <laughs> so closely around the room and somehow we got it pretty well. But yeah, there's a shot of like the Russian uh, the Russian ambassador who's like, he like cracks at one point. Uh, so just one more time, tying it back to this to this hyper-masculine guy, right? This buck guy. Uh, when the, the doomsday device is described by Dr. Strangelove initially as this device that uh, will automatically activate and will kill the world, and it's a nuclear deter- and it's a deterrent in that way, and Buck's reaction is, man, I wish we had one of those <laughs> doomsday right. devices. Like, yeah, he's so dumb, man. <laughs> so, so stupid. stupid. <laughs> So back over in the base, we get the whole scene with Bat Guano after after uh, our commander kills himself, and the uh, trying to and not having enough money for the payphone to to do a collect call to the president. All so funny, and then this guy who's just like completely oblivious and 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 not having any of it, and then and then the you'll have to answer to the Coca Cola company. Mm-hmm. Really, really funny stuff. So funny that that moment is amazing. That you know after this you're gonna have to answer to the Coca Cola company. <laughs> Oh god! Well, and you're, you're you prevert. Don't do it. You don't have any pervert preversions in there when he goes into the thing. Yeah, when he goes into the uh, to the phone booth. So, so when he goes into the phone booth, what I love is that like he try he doesn't have the change to do it, so he tries to do collect, and then the White House won't accept the collect call. I find that to be <laughs> so funny because obviously they wouldn't because people are probably always yeah. trying to collect call the the White House that they don't have to pay. Yeah. It. But that is well, can, so and like the idea that you could pick up a payphone and call the president is kind of ludicrous in and of itself. But yeah. it's so it's so funny 
So I think the last main thing we need to talk about, in, in my opinion, maybe there's some more stuff, is is Doctor Strange loves monologues he gives at the end of this movie, which are it's some it's one of my favorite things I think I've ever seen. It's so good. His performance of his body while he's talking and he's like writhing and he's punching himself and he's like trying to stop his arm from, I, I assume just like giving the Nazi salute. And it's it, in one point he even does it. And then he like stops himself and the physical performance matched with the stuff he's saying in this like kind of German caricature. And he even calls him mind Fuhrer to, to start it off and then corrects yeah. himself. And he's like, Oh, when, like nobody president. reacts. Yeah. And then when he gets to the Nazi salute, nobody reacts. So I thought that was all really funny. how like everyone played it so straight. Like they're yeah. taking this very seriously. Um, God, just the stuff he's saying and the del- the, the delight he has as he's describing the idea of like oh ten to one ratio and and you know <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna have to repopulate the and, earth and, and he's trying to calculate yeah. he's calculating the the like uh, the isotopes like the the what is it called yeah. the half life I guess of like how yeah, long yeah, it's yeah. gonna be radioactive and everything and he's just like oh, 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 like trying to work it and stuff <laughs> he, and, he can't even get it out of his coat because yeah. he's so his like whole body is just like fighting like, itself i don't even know what's happening like what is yeah. happening with him so in the scene you have to, is there behind the scenes stuff for this like how did he come up with this i didn't see anything specific as to like what exactly he was doing but i did see that like stanley kubrick used uh his black gloves whenever handling lights because lights stay really hot even if you shut them off on a on a set mm. and uh uh seller saw that and was like let me have that glove and he like wore the glove and it became part of the character for the evil hand like his evil hand <laughs> wore the black because yeah, only that hand sinister. had the glove on <laughs> yeah so uh and i love that it's like i think it's this idea that like this is like a the so the world war ii is ended and he is a german scientist who was able yep. to get over to the u.s side and yep. was still he was still like based clearly, off of real things like we had nazi scientists in our employ absolutely. bad ones too bad you can get yep. really deep into that some bad ones you had me listen to that actually the uh yeah uh joseph mengala stuff yeah the, uh, uh, last podcast on the left did yeah. a deep dive into that yeah it's crazy. We had really bad uh, Nazis on our on our payroll. So yep, just throwing that out there. And so and uh, so it's like it's it's very dark, but the but it's so funny too because it's like it's like one of those things that like you, it, it, there's power in laughing at it, I guess. Mm-hmm. But um, he also to me is like a symbol of fascism and how it has infiltrated our government, right? And and, mm-hmm. and like this guy is this he's so delighted in this moment. Like it's like it, it, this is once again a character who's like this is the moment I've lived for. Right. And he's so excited about it. And not only that, the, the, the end of the movie where he's able to stand, yeah. right? And it's like and the rock. And it, it, it's like, it's like a miracle has happened because the world is ending and it's, mm. it's everything he's dreamt of. And his whole plan about the mines and all this stuff is like straight up eugenics and, and, and like repopulating the earth and, and all this stuff that like the Nazis were all about. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's so good. And so, over the top and wild and um funny man so funny Mm -hmm. it's and that's what the that's like the fascist thing is like waiting for an opportunity to strike when like weakness is there and then like taking power and that that would be like 90 years go by and and i love that uh buck he's talking about like what if the russians have been like they're gearing up for 90 years and they come out and they're more powerful than us and and like he's already thinking about the war after the war and everything after the war 100 years from now or whatever yeah so and then when we come out yeah but I love Strange Love because um, the, the moment, it's one of the most iconic lines to me is when he's like, why didn't you tell the world? When he, they're talking about like the, the, the Russians have the, the hidden bomb and like uh-huh. the idea of nuclear deterrent is like, I have it and you have it. If, and then like, if you don't tell the world, then it's like, why do you even have it? Because there's no point. Yeah. The doomsday device. Yeah. So funny. Uh, they're like, yeah. we were going to in like a week or yeah, whatever. Why yeah. didn't you, why didn't you tell the world? It's just so funny. Um so strange love at the end yeah he's like writhing writhing and fighting himself and punching himself and like falling out of the chair and then yeah he stands up and it's like that the rise of this this fascist moment and it's like he's rising yeah. up and like he he there because basically he's his whole plan is like afterwards the people who are in the bunker will become the leaders and and carry forward the world and it's just yeah. so funny and so dark and then and you then, can see like in a, in a way buck is like america too like he's the average american in and in, in, in the way that he immediately is able to set aside his morals and his religion because he's like the foundation of of the monogamous relationship is is, is not going to be able to work in this situation right and yeah, it's and like he's, he's like, like giddy it. about it like he's yeah. he's so into it even though like ostensibly he's not he's a religious guy and all this stuff but um, he's so quick to set that aside at the prospect of this 
Um, oh, that we're going to be highly selective in which women are going to be into, you know, like it's for their sexual prowess or whatever. And it's yeah. just, it's so, it's like this fantasy, right? Yeah. And, 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 and this is all about the destruction of the world, millions, billions of people dying, yet all these guys are so excited about it. Because they're they're gonna you know reap the they're benefits. gonna be one of the people yeah. who are gonna live and they're yeah. gonna yeah they're gonna reap the benefits and and they com- immediately convince themselves that this is like the only thing to do and it's actually a good thing and um, I don't know and then there's also just the the fact that the president is sitting there on the other end of this and we know that that is the same actor like I, I don't know I, I think that's really cool mm-hmm. to see the, how he's kind of reacting to it and going oh what about that and, uh, and he's it's his own performance essentially right. that he's reacting to it's pretty wild yeah. So uh, really quickly, I just wanted to knock out these last couple of things. The, so it's a really interesting order how everything ends, right? So the bomb is dropping in the perspective of uh, Kong, the commander who's like riding the, riding the bomb down and, ex- and then it hits. And then we cut to the war room where, they're all, where Dr. Strangelove has this whole thing and you know, it's seemingly the bomb has gone off. But then it cuts to, after his whole speech and everything, cuts to the actual bombs going off with we'll meet again, which is the funniest yeah. part. All real, real footage too of of, yeah. of bombs going off. Actual yeah. bomb testing and stuff, yeah. Yeah. Um, so and and we'll meet again. That that song playing that is so like poignant and funny and and sad and scary all at the same time. Yeah. And and it's also like a fantastic song. So it, yeah. it's what a way to end the movie. But I just felt like that really chopped up weird order that everything because the bomb went off and then we get everything inside the war room and then we see the explosions and everything. Because it's like the reaction. Well, I assume the the second are supposed to be more like the the, the doomsday device, maybe yeah. triggering or something. I don't right. know. Um, regardless, yeah, I think uh, brilliant. Um, what what a fun movie, and and I think uh, you know, I think you could, and I'm sure just tons of stuff has been written about this. You could really dive into to all the different social and and satirical things that it's that it's trying to do. Definitely. So I have one more thing I want to talk about, but I want to wait to the very end. Um, and just to tease it a little bit, Stanley Kubrick enlisted Terry Southern, who helped write the screenplay for th- for this film. Mm-hmm. Th- he enlisted him to script a sequel titled Son of Strange Love. Okay. And you're going to tell us about that? Yeah, I want to tell you about it. Okay, cool. they ha- He had a specific director in mind that I find fascinating. Okay, so before we get to that, then, I do want to announce our next project, which is going to be a one-week project, but I think it's something that uh, people are going to be excited for. We are going to tackle Christopher Nolan, and we're going to do Memento, um, which is one of his early films, but a film that I adore and we know is based off of a short story. Yeah, Christopher Nolan, fantastic director. I'm sure everyone's familiar. You know, the last 10, 20 years, he's been prolific. And, uh, you know, yeah, one of my favorites. Putting out really interesting films that, that really make you think. Uh, I just want to shout out uh, Stephen E. again. Uh, Thank you for commissioning this. Um, We hope you enjoyed it. It's been these last two weeks, and it's been a really fun project for us. Um, And if you want to find out how you can uh, join him in commissioning stuff, uh, definitely check out our Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash ink to film. And uh, like I said, we got that special offer going where you're going to get a token that you wouldn't otherwise normally get for, for just being at the lowest tier. So check that out if you're at all interested. You can connect with us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all of those at Ink to Film. And make sure to join our Council of Inklings because we, we post polls in there. We get listener feedback. We do all kinds of stuff to try to connect with the community, and, and it's a great way to, to uh, stay in touch. Absolutely. And if, another way that you can help this podcast out, rating and review. You know Whether that's on iTunes, Facebook, anywhere that you can publicly talk about it, it'd be great. Um, that always helps. And then also just telling a friend, word of mouth. Like If you know somebody who's into you know, reading and and into film. Tell them about this podcast and and help us continue to grow. Thank you to Jennifer Delazana for providing our transcripts. And thank you to Multimusic for the use of our intro and outro music. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about here, I find this to be really fascinating because it's a sequel, which like, you know, typically I'd be like, I'm not really interested in that. But um, in 1995, as I said, Kubrick enlisted Terry Southern to script a sequel titled Son of Strange Love. Kubrick had Terry Gilliam in mind to direct. Wow. The script was never completed, but index cards laying out the story's basic structure were found among Southern's papers after his October 1995 death. It was set largely in underground bunkers where Dr. Strangelove (laughs) had taken refuge with a group of women. In 2013, Gilliam commented, I was told after Kubrick died by someone who was dealing with all of that. And they said that he had been interested in trying to do another Strangelove with me directing. I never knew about it until after he died, but I would have loved to. Wow. Yeah. I would have loved to see that. That's, I mean, that, I mean, it sounds, 
I, I, seeing more of Strange Love would be good. It's interesting because he's. Uh, uh, I feel like there's less of him in this movie than I thought. Like, because you don't even see him until like really the third act, other than like a little bit here and there. Um, yeah. And but I think it's also one of those things that's like less is more in a way too, though, because that character kind of works best in being just small doses. I think. Yeah. I mean, his introduction, like the shot of him in shadow and yeah. like the way he's when like he rolled spins out. Around. Is, it's so iconic and yeah. so funny. And it's like he's been crippled by his by his Nazism, I guess. I don't know if we can read into so. that that way. Maybe I, I, I don't want to be ableist about it, but it just seems like that's what they're trying to say with him being in the, in the, in the wheelchair. Um, yeah, I think so. And it's also sending up like like a, it's kind of a throwback to something like M or, or like early German like pre-war germany yeah with with films like m and things like that with okay. like the really eccentric super eccentric bad guy who's like over the top right. but also like could to be feared and stuff and yeah. it's very like very film like his historically significant i feel like and and it's interesting because um i noticed in this watch through and i didn't mention it earlier but um even before that he's officially introduced i think he's sitting around the table and you actually do see him because he's got his glasses on and he's got his hair so he's actually pretty identifiable, mm-hmm. and it's when the president obviously isn't on screen. Um, it's when the other guy is like talking on the phone and stuff. Buck, um, it, off to the in the background, I think you can kind of see him sitting there at the table. So it's it's it, I like that like consistency. Like he is in the room, even though he hasn't really yeah. said anything yet. Yeah, I had a great time watching this, and and honestly, I think I'm gonna rewatch it again soon. Like yeah. I, I had such a good time watching it, and like I would love to relive it again here soon. So so fun. I, I'm probably gonna check it out. Yeah, we hope you join us next week. We're going to be doing Memento, like we said earlier, and it's going to be our 99th episode, so our you know, penultimate before the 100th. Um, so excited about that, and I uh, hope you join us. So until next time. Thanks for listening. <laughs>